Hello and welcome back to WD18, the Watford fan channel. We've been crying out for signings and they've been keeping us busy this week. A plethora of deals have been made and today we're talking about the fourth signing report this week, free agent Angelo Ogbonna. Today's special guest, Jack Elderton. Uh, thanks for joining Jack on Saturday morning. I know you were working late last night. Um, tell us a bit about you and what you do. So I work for Analytics United. Thank you for having me. And um, we're a sort of lots of different things for West Ham. So we do uh, podcasts, post-match, pre-match. Um, and then we also work with the club directly in the, on the media side, producing pre-match analysis and sort of player performance analysis. We've we've had, I know you've had a busy week at, at Watford. We've had a, a, a busy week a couple of weeks ago now where we signed, it seemed like we were signing everyone <laughs> uh, in one week. I think we made about four signings, same as you. Um, and yeah, doing that was, was similarly busy, getting ready to do all the analysis and, and preparing that for the club. So I can imagine it's been busy on your end. Yeah, I think your signings were a bit more high profile than ours, <laughs> a bit more money spent, but um, it's all relative. Um, just before we start, just as an outsider, Jack, your thoughts on Watford as a club? Any memories? Really enjoyed uh, my trips to Vicarage Road. Um, really, really um, had a, always had a good time. Uh, probably because we've had some pretty good results, uh, so they, they stand out as, as, as good away days. Um, but yeah, not nothing really major. Just always, always enjoyed um, watching Watford. The only only negative memory I have is is of us having an incredible first half when we just moved to the new stadium, and then uh, Troy Deeney. I think had a pretty inspirational halftime team talk and we fell apart and that was kind of the beginning of a really bad season for us um so yeah that's the only standout negative memory but yeah um nothing much more than that yeah no we'll touch on that game a bit later actually um and yeah i've always loved going to london stadium again mainly because we had good results there i remember around christmas time delafeu and Pereira scored so um yeah i won't talk too much about that we'll talk about it <laughs> but um We've been working hard this week to provide you guys as much content as possible. So if you have enjoyed it, we'd really appreciate you if you subscribed, hit the like button, give us a comment. Um, it really does make a big difference. Uh, today we are talking about Angelo Ogbonna. Yesterday we learned the news. We were doing a live yesterday and we heard the breaking news that Wesley Hoot was leaving the club and we kind of said we, he's going to need replacing. About an hour or so later, Andrew French reported Former West Ham defender Angelo Ogbonna is the experienced defender that Watford will add to their options at the back. The Watford Observer understands the 36-year-old, who is currently a free agent, will move to Vicarage Road before the transfer window closes. Jack, your initial reaction to a Watford son in Ogbonna? Really glad he's found somewhere because uh, I, I had no idea where he was going and he's a fantastic um, character. So, I mean, if you're looking for someone who uh, has leadership qualities and um and will be a really good person around the club in the dressing room it's always seems to really get it uh, and puts a lot of effort into really understanding the club and, and and working out how to fit in and speaks very well then um then he'll be great on on, on that side of things and and i think all west ham fans have a, a, a hugely positive impression of, of, of angelo and i'm just really pleased that, that he's found somewhere good to to, to go to next i think was a con concern really about what level what level it would be and um it seems like he, he he's gone somewhere where it's not like a ridiculous ridiculous drop off or he feels like he's going on too long um so i i'm pleased for him i think it's a good probably a good match um and i really hope he does he does well uh, because last season i think was a little bit a little bit of a challenge because we probably probably too late in his career to still be playing in the Premier League. So I, he kind of deserves the opportunity to prove what a good player he is again. And I hope I hope he does that this season. Absolutely. I mean, just a little bit of background on him. Um, born in Cassino, Italy, from Cassino to Casaberry Park in Watford. Um, he started his career at Torino, had a loan spell at Crotone before getting his big move at Juventus. I think Antonio Conte signed him and then he played under... Allegri won two league titles at Juve, a couple of cups. He's got 13 caps for Italy. Um, and I know he played for Italy at the Euros in 2012, 2016. He was in the squad anyway. They obviously got to the final in 2012. Um, and then he joined the mighty West Ham in 2015 under our, our old friend Slavan Bilic. So I know it was a while ago, Jack, but at the time, what did you make of that signing? Um, and what was it like kind of 2015 West Ham? 
I think we were really excited. It was a kind of a strange time at West Ham. We'd gone through a summer where we had sort of quite lofty expectations in terms of the manager that was going to come in. I think we went through several targets. I know Jurgen Klopp was one of them at, at, right. at the time. And uh, unsurprisingly, he turned us down and went to Liverpool. Uh, and we got down sort of down, down the list and, and eventually settled on, on Slavin Bilic, which was exciting because he was a really good character previously at the club sort of a seemed to be sort of a really sort of um charismatic guy that would understand that same way i was just talking about with angelo really uh, and bring some energy into the place which was really lacking towards the end of sam allardyce's tenure where things had gotten really toxic i think in that last season uh we we won a game against uh, i believe it was hull 2-1 um or might have been 1-0 and They'd had 10 men since about half an hour in, uh, and we barely generated any shots. I think we scored right at the end of the match to to, to, to win it. And um, the the team got booed off and the manager got booed and he sort of cupped his ear to the crowd. And it was just gone completely at the at, at the end of, of Allardyce's um, tenure. So it was good to have someone through the door who was A, really charismatic, and B, really committed to playing almost foolishly attacking um, uh, football. So I think everyone was excited about that. And uh, and having Angelo through the door really at the time was was very exciting. Someone who'd come from a uh, really big club, um, had done really well, uh, had a really good reputation, was going to bring some sort of ability to play out from the back, had some pace about him, could cover in that left channel. Um, so I think everyone was, was, was really excited about his arrival. And um, he was going to need to have a very good season given uh the fact that we were going to be playing what Payet, Lanzini, uh, I mm -hmm. think Mikel Antonio had a stint at right back. <laughs> uh it was a bit of a bonkers team. Yeah, I mean for people that don't know, could you describe him as a player, like the profile, um, maybe even kind of physically how big he is, left foot, right foot, position, etc. Sure. So uh, at the time, he was quite a speedy, um, tall, uh, strong left footed centre back, um, really confident on the ball, uh, very difficult to press, which helped us a lot at the time. I think he was very comfortable receiving, especially if our build up was a little bit stunted and we could go back into Ogbonna and he wouldn't panic, uh, which was a big thing given that I think we'd been used to, and I'm a huge fan, massive fan of James Collins, but we'd been used to the, that kind of uh, approach to any kind of press was just like, right, lump it uh, as far as you can away away from defense. So it was good to have have him in there. Um, and then, yeah, just, just very, very, very good in the jewels, um, good in the air, threat at set pieces. So seemed at the time, and was really when he first came in, a bit of a complete package and a, a sort of fix all for a back line that that needed that kind of character in there. It's probably worth saying that if you're thinking about West Ham's left side at the time, that was the, and it has been really since, the hub of the team creatively. We had Cresswell down there, who was an incredible overlapping fullback earlier in his career, got loads of assists, um, really creative from the back, incredibly progressive, also very, very good on the ball. And then Payet, ahead with Lanzini sort of drifting over into the number. So it's this incredible uh, quadrant of, of players who are super comfortable on the ball and, uh, and really, really good for us going forward. Um, so yeah, it was a key part of that. When you said uh, James Collins, it reminded me of one Craig Dawson who uh, got yes. relegated with us and then arrived with you guys and turned into Ballon Dawson, of course. Um, yes. I'm, I'm right in saying Ogbon is left footed, isn't he? Yes, yeah, yeah which will be key for us in terms of that Wesley Hoot replacement and that balance. Um, I was surprised to see he's nearly played 250 games for West Ham. What was yeah. what, what was peak of Bonner? Obviously loads of seasons since 2015. And what kind of, what were his career highlights? Difficult to say, really. I mean, he, he probably didn't, uh, it's hard to, to remember the defence that much from when he first came in. And I think we were probably quite vulnerable at the back. Um, that season, our strength was definitely more, what we did going forward so I, I don't really remember him hitting the ground running straight away what I do then remember is him massively improving and becoming the most reliable figure at the back for quite a long time um, and whether that was playing in a sort of back three or a back four back three he probably moved to the center um, and kind of control marshal the defense be the most important character back there um, remember towards the end um, of our time at Upton Park that he was playing quite well. Uh, big highlight in that season was, would have been his winner against Liverpool in the Cup in, in extra time. Um, 
I'm sure he would have been partnered probably with Winston Reed at the time. Not perfect for balance because both of them probably want to be on the on the on the left hand side, and and both of them will. You know, build up centre backs probably lacked a, a more of a James Collins type in 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 that back too, um, and then later really is when when it started to to come together and he was incredibly impressive before he um, before he got his big injury before he uh, injured his knee, um, just again super super reliable so strong um, at the back from set pieces uh, and everything and that partnership um, with with Dawson. Um, or even before, actually, before Dawson came in, um, and it would have been, I guess, with Zuma. Um, that at that point, when Moyes first came in, we were incredible defensively, really, really, really good, and and super reliable. And then had the two of them as uh, you know, whoever it was, whether Dawson, Zuma, the centre backs we had at the time, scored so many goals from set pieces as well. Um, even before before them with Balbuena, uh, I remember a game against. I think it was Leeds, uh, where we were winning one single goal margin, and it's about 92nd minute, and Leeds had quite a lot of pressure on us. And we went up on, on the counter attack, and uh, Ogbonna dribbled the ball out of defense, played a through ball down the right hand side for Balbuena, who uh, cut it back to Ogbonna. I think it was th that way around either Ogbonna down the right hand side or Balbuena down the right hand side, and then one of them crossed for the other. Uh, to, to try and score a header in, in the box in the sort of 93rd minute, which in a way is not exactly what you want your centre-backs to be doing when you're trying Did to... Did you send to David Moyes? <laughs> yeah. Jesus. <laughs> yeah, exactly. The two centre-backs steaming forward on the counter-attack. That kind of gives you a sense of what a sort of lovable character he, he is and um, and the kind of things he was doing at the time. It just seemed beyond anything you'd expect him to be capable of, you know? Um, so, yeah, brilliant. And then massively surprising when he came back from injury i think we thought he would drop off a cliff not be involved at all anymore actually did really well uh more so in the center of a back three then so he had people covering him for for pace and and, and moving into the channels but but really very good and then it was only really last season like i said that it became obvious that probably trying to push towards the european spots with him in in, in the back line wasn't going to be wasn't going to be possible because he just didn't quite have that speed any longer um to either get out when when you have sort of number number nines that are dropping off into sort of the ten space, he wouldn't be there in time. Or if you had people who wanted to get in behind all the time, he'd find that very difficult and often drop too deep and pull the defensive line with him, and then make it difficult for us to have any kind of press on on the ball. Um, but apart from last season, an incredibly impressive uh, career at West Ham. Yeah, I wanted to touch on kind of that tactical side that you mentioned and him playing as part of a back three. Obviously, Tom Cleverley, we know is is employing kind of three at the back. Um, where do you think he's best suited? Like, obviously, he's left-footed. Is it the left side of a back three where we feel like there's a bit of a gap in our team? Or do you think, because of his age, he might be suited more centrally where he can kind of work with the, the younger other, other, other defenders? I suppose it depends on how you play it. It depends whether you, you're coming up against teams that have tens in the half spaces and you need your 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 lateral centre backs to step up um and engage quite uh, intensely to stop teams from being able to generate pressure you know in the premier league at the moment we have so many three box three teams um where it's sort of the double tens and the striker if you think like palace last season with sort of elise and eze and then mateta you need your centre backs in those situations if you're going to end up in that sort of back five to be really aggressive otherwise they just can control the game and you never really can get any any of the ball um, so, so that's where as a sort of wide centre back in the Premier League, it kind of ended for him and he sort of moved into the centre. If you are playing more of a, a, a low block and you're not intending to go out and press in any way, or you're not coming up against teams that have that sort of double 10, um, set up, or you want your wide centre backs to be more covering for a, for a central centre back that's going to step out and be really aggressive on a striker, then he probably could do that role. Um, but yeah, from a, from a very Premier League fan sort of perspective, we would definitely see him as a as a central centre back in a five, someone that you rely on for being excellent in the air, excellent physically, and even you know last season I think we played him against would have been uh, he came in for games against Liverpool and Arsenal, and I think we won both of those games, and we were playing really proper low block foot, you know, like hanging out the whole team inside the box, and he was exceptional, uh, you know, almost man of the, definitely man of the match against uh, Liverpool, and I think almost man of the match in, in the game against Arsenal as well. So, in those situations, I mean, his defensive basics are, are, are amazing. So he's he'll be brilliant in that kind of setup. 
Yeah, I I think, especially after what you said there, I think he'll be more central. I think if you looked at when we first played Millwall, how high our back line was trying to kind of eliminate any transitions. And I think we got exposed numerous of times. So you're going to want the more mobile players kind of as those wider centre-backs. So I see him, I do see him centrally. Um, and I thought the same as Wesley Hoot because he's not the most mobile. But could you just give us maybe his biggest weakness and then his uh, biggest strength? Biggest weakness, definitely what I was sort of getting at in terms of jumping to press now. If you need him to be uh, able to do that in situations where you're maybe getting exposed higher up the pitch. So if the press is beaten, you are going really aggressive and you, then you need your centre-backs to kind of take that uh, really aggressive action to support the press. Um he won't be able to do that. He won't be able to do that anymore. That's the kind of thing that just completely went um, last season. Not surprising. He's had two big knee injuries. He's going quite late into his career now. So just that mobility and sharpness to to, to get out and, and make an impact in those situations. You know, I, I mentioned the Palace game earlier. I think he was up against Elise and it just was, it was just unfair, really. He was just trying to jump out to him and Elise was just rolling every single time because he was arriving too late. Um, and it was just opening a gap in our defence repeatedly. So I think that's where he's he's really quite weak now. Um, also, you know, if you were to play him in a back four and your left back goes high and then he needs to cover into into you know into the left space against a winger, same problem. It's all really mobility issues um, and speed. He's going to struggle with that. Um, biggest strength, aerials. Uh, yeah, aerials uh, and physical battles put him up against a really difficult six foot two, uh, six foot three big lad up front and uh Ogbonna will love that he'll have fun um he'll he'll enjoy it he'll relish that challenge and um you'll get a, a kind of attitude out of him that will lift the rest of the team as well he just gets so into it when he's in those battles and uh, um and you know he's a leader from the back as well so he's get him winning a few duels early in a game and he's just sort of g's up everyone around him and the, the the rest of the defense starts to feel like it's unbeatable and that's what you get in those games last season against teams like arsenal and liverpool where he's just pulling off incredible last ditch tackles blocks uh shoving people off of him um and, and winning the ball and the rest of the defense suddenly starts to feel like yeah we've we, we've got this uh and that's the energy he can really bring to a team yeah, sounds good. I feel like we've got quite a good now airily dominant team. In previous seasons, we've kind of been really soft and set pieces. And I wanted to ask about set pieces you were talking about earlier. Is he a threat? Um, Massive. On the other side of the pitch? Because Massive. Tom Cleverley, we've seen him trying some new kind of routines and it's something that he said we want to improve set pieces. Um, could, could we see him popping up with a few goals? You could. He's a massive threat uh, in the opposition box. Um I, I think the only player that, well, maybe Dawson and Zuma both slightly outdid him in terms of threat from set pieces, but th those guys are, are nuts. I mean, they're, they're almost goal-scoring centre-backs, the amount of goals they get um, every season. He's still a, a really, really big threat. It depends on how you set your set pieces up, I guess. Um, you know, we always used to do it with with him attacking the centre of the box and or the front post, and then Dawson would attack the back post. and. Uh, Ogbonna could attract enough attention that he'd have Dawson then free run to the to, to the back post and just sort of run through anyone that's in, in the way. Um, so, yeah, I think it, I, I'm not sure what role he would pick up in in a system now, whether he's got the kind of speed actually to, to do that kind of back post run and get mm -hmm. on the end of things, not sure. But having him as someone that, even if he isn't scoring goals, is going to demand so much attention uh, and, and, and players are going to be so concerned about him because he's so dominant in those situations. He might open open room for a striker at the back post, winning flick-ons at the front post or whatever. So, yeah, definitely someone that I'd look at as a, as a real weapon in the opposition box from set pieces. Yeah, I mean, I was looking like yesterday. I was surprised to see he played 17 games for West Ham last season in kind of all tournaments, six starts in the Premier League. Like you mentioned, man of the match performance at the Emirates I think only two teams kept a clean sheet at the Emirates of the league last season. Um, but obviously he's 36. I don't know how much championship you watch. How do you think he's going to adapt to playing in the championship? Or have you seen enough for him last season to think he'll be absolutely fine? I think he'll be okay. I hope he'll be okay. You know, I'm, maybe I'm being positive from a West Ham perspective because we love him and he did such a you know good job for us for such a long time. Um that there is obviously that concern that against nippy attackers and players that have got 
the kind of movement that's really clever and you know know that they've got a center back that's maybe a little bit slower and going to drag them all the way out to, to to the wings or drag them all the way out really you know dropping off really deep into sort of almost number eight positions then yeah you do worry it's going to be difficult for him in those situations if anyone can get turned and get running at him where he's within 10 yards of the halfway line uh that's that's a big problem um if he's deeper he'll be great and and in terms of just i know the championship has changed but in terms of that sort of classic view of the championship where there's a few sort of bigger forwards around and uh, and bigger threats in terms of what they can do physically uh, and the intensity of the league physically he'll like i said he'll love it he'll he'll enjoy that he'll actively enjoy that he won't be worried about that at all he'll be looking forward to it so um so on that side of things, yeah, I think he'll be perfectly, perfectly comfortable. Um, and and actually, in terms of the role that he's stepping into as as a, as a leader, um, he won't be bothered by coming into a new group and having an expectation that he'll sort of take control a bit and uh, and, and marshal a back line or or be really good in the dressing room. He'll be really completely comfortable uh, with that. Yeah, I think that's a big thing. That kind of leadership that he brings, I think it's something that obviously. Wesley Hoot was our kind of on-pitch captain last season. So him going is, was a big blow, really, player of the season as well. So Tom Cleverley's mentioned the kind of about that leadership, that winning mentality he wants to kind of kind of make. I wanted to I wanted to touch on, I put a tweet out yesterday about his game at, at Arsenal and I got so many replies from West Ham fans. Why is he so loved? You've spoken about kind of his attitude, but is there any kind of off-the-field stuff that he's done with leadership? But why is he so loved by the West Ham fans? I, I probably should say, you know, I haven't mentioned it, but well, first first of all, he played in the team that was, I mean, if you're a West Ham fan, he's played in two teams that everyone will will remember and, you know, talk to their grandchildren about or whatever, winning a trophy and then the 15-16 season, last season at Upton Park, where we were just so fun to watch and so exciting going forward. And he was such an important part of that. And actually, the thing that that, that probably is, is best to latch on to next is that, like I said about Bilic and his team, uh, it was full of characters, and um, and he was definitely one of those, and and that's probably what um, has helped him at West Ham a, a, a great deal. He's really funny. He's really funny, um, and in terms of just getting getting on around, you know, players from all different backgrounds and stuff like that, and being able to be a leader and being able to communicate really well, being great in interviews and stuff like that, endearing yourself to fan bases, having that skill of being really funny uh, uh, and being able to, you know make anyone laugh uh is is a, is a real help he's a bit nuts uh, i mean i remember noble talking about having had several fights with him in in the dressing room and you know at half times or or whatever because he can be a bit sort of if he's not Italian. happy yeah if he's not <laughs> happy with with what's going on um in a performance he can be a bit uh loud i think <laughs> uh in the dressing room but i think that's a good thing uh, and then you see sort of right down towards the end of his career we signed loads of players a couple of summers ago knife a came in and the club had set up sort of an interview there's an interviewer there speaking to him and i'm not sure if even angelo was meant to be there but they sort of swooped into the back of the interview uh it was sort of patted him on the top of the head and went new me <laughs> you're the new me you know <laughs> um and i think just that ability to make people feel comfortable um it, it is it's really useful and, and partly that is a thing with uh with, with players who have played at west ham and, and managed to get the fans on side if you look at someone like pablo fornals for example who was really well loved at west ham and you go to every time he posts about something that's going on at betis there's just like thousands of mm -hmm. uh, of west ham fans commenting so that's a that is a bit of a thing you know players like angelo and pablo who really get on well at west ham and the fans end up really taking to them they will wherever they go, whatever they do next, there are going to be hundreds, if not thousands of West Ham fans commenting on the, everything they post, wishing them well. Yeah, I just wanted to read out a couple of the tweets that I got. So, one of the best to wear the shirt. Love Big Oggy. What a player and what a man. Fantastic. He's saying in England, clearly happy with his family. Um, I hope you guys draw Watford in the Cup. Um, you'll, you'll absolutely love him. That's a swear word there. Absolute rock. Please look <laughs> after him. We love him. Best of luck, Oggy. Take care of him. You'll love him for sure. Baller um some player and a person take care of him so lots of really really positive kind of goodwill um uncle where's that nickname come from i don't i think it i think it's i think it came from the players because they started calling calling him uncle Ange. i think um at, at some point probably about 2017 or 2018 and it's just stuck so from since you know from then 
West Ham fans have always referred to him as uh, as Uncle Ange, and I think in house club media he's had a few uncles thrown at him uh, <laughs> there as well. So yeah, it's stuck, and and it actually fits his character really well. He has that kind of you know elder statesman of the dressing room, funny guy, uh, but good leader um, character. So yeah. Um, it works it works perfectly for him the only thing i probably didn't mention when we we're talking about strengths that's that is worth just doubling down on again is that like i like i said one thing you don't lose uh regardless of what happens with your mobility is that that press resistance and in terms of setting up and playing out from the back he'll he'll help a lot on, on that side of things yeah that's great to hear i mean just my view on the, the signing it kind of came out of left field um and I didn't kind of realise he was on the radar in terms of a free agent as well. I think that leadership, we signed Jake Livermore last season and at the start, everyone was a bit like, oh, an older player, what's the point? But the, the qualities that he brought to our team and kind of settling games down, um, I don't think he might necessarily will start every game, but the fact that we've got the opportunity to use him, we know injuries are going to happen. And like you said, we're trying to play out of the back under Clevs. The fact that he's going to bring that balance to the defence, I think the leadership is a huge thing. So I've been really impressed because Watford fans, we've been we've been pining for signings and this week we've had them all at once, but this came out of nowhere and I think he just is exactly what the squad needs and a perfect Wes Who replacement. So I'm really, really excited about that. Um, before we wrap up, I just wanted to um, highlight this tweet. I don't know if you've seen it before. Is it? Yeah, I knew what it was going to be. <laughs> <laughs> this is the this game I was talking about. about. This is the game I was talking about, right? Where, where the yeah, with yeah. the pirate Ravona cross, and we were, we were. I think Dini said in the interview afterwards that we, you know, we were taking the mick a bit, and you know, players doing roulettes and other such nonsense when we were two 0 up, and uh, and then and then the comeback started. Uh, I mean. To be perfectly honest with you, there's no other way I can really talk about this other than saying that it's just classic Angelo. Uh, I, there's just something about that that is so him. Um, either slight unawareness or possible this might be quite funny. Um, and <laughs> <laughs> uh, posting it. So, yeah, I've no idea uh, why he decided to post it because it was at an incredibly toxic time uh, at West Ham. But when you look back on it, you think, yeah, he might have just thought that's funny and had a, had a good laugh. The fact that he's done that and you guys still love him probably says a lot about the man. Um, we will wrap things up there. Thank you so much, Jack. Loved having a chat and kind of you got me more excited about uh, Ogbonna joining Watford. Um, for any Watford fans who are interested in some West Ham analytics, where can we find you? We'll obviously put some descript uh, some links in our in our description. But what, what have you got going on? Uh, we can find me on Twitter at Jack Elderton. I I post about everything we're doing at Analytics United. So there's loads loads of stuff on there. Um, AnalyticsUnited.co.uk um, to keep up with everything that, that we're doing over there. And um, yeah, and hopefully it won't won't just be West Ham. Hopefully we'll we'll get to 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 branch out. That's the plan anyway. In the in the future, we really want to to kind of help. Um, Analytics is getting more and more important in football, and more and more used in terms of fan media and and, and just in the in the in the traditional media as well. And uh, the big thing that we want to do is try and, you know, there's a lot of acronyms. Try and explain what everything means in in, in simple terms, and and hopefully um, make it a little bit less mystifying. So so that's what we're doing. Yeah, we like to try and dabble in a bit of a analysis on the channel as well. So um, be sure to check out what Jack's up to. Um, Angelo Abona is joining Watford as the Wesley Hoot replacement. Um, comment if you think it's a good signing. Um, tell us what you think, where he'll play for Watford. Um, at some point, we'll be doing another video about our latest signing, the third or fourth, Pierre Duomo. Um, but if you've enjoyed this one, drop it a like, hit the subscribe button. If you're going to today's game against Derby, enjoy it. Uh, we'll be back after today's game Sunday, reacting to it. Um, can Watford make it four out of four at the start of the season? Have a good weekend, everyone, and up the audits.